So uh, last time we talked about SQP uh, methods, uh, like sequential quadratic programming and how to do like kind of nonlinear large scale optimization. Um, the gist is, you know, turn everything into a QP and uh, take steps like that. Um, and then we talked a bit about um, direct collocation, which, you know, in in essence is just take your like stock continuous time optimal control problem, like the original problem, and just discretize everything and then throw it into a large scale optimization solver on your computer. That's the direct thing. Um, and this is in contrast to indirect methods, which kind of leverage various flavors of optimal control ideas like Pontryag and, you know, um, dynamic programming to kind of like optimize the, the, the like official, you know, difference between direct and indirect is for indirect methods, you optimize, AKA use like opt continuous optimal control theory, like dynamic programming, Pontryag, and then you discretize, whereas direct you like discretize the original problem and just throw it in the computer. Um, so yeah, so those are the two main paradigms. So now you kind of know a little bit of each. Um, so we're going to today talk about um, a little bit of a recap on those things and uh, kind of what the pros and cons are, what the differences are, just to kind of finish that story off. So the like indirect DDP style thing versus the direct like collocation style thing and when when you might want to use either one. And then we're going to start this whole attitude discussion that I mentioned. Uh, basically how to do stuff with uh, 3D rotations. Basically how to like do cool things like backflips, right? Everyone likes backflips. Okay. Any questions about anything? We're getting into it. All right, here we go. So yeah, I would say like kind of trying to give a little bit of a uh, a recap, you know, where we've gone so far. Um, and we've covered a lot of ground as far as like the basics. Uh, so we're going to talk about, you know, deterministic optimal control algorithms. And first off, we've got sort of the, the linear, uh, linear systems kind of story. And I would say the right way to think about this, because we obviously use these things on nonlinear problems a lot, is really this is, you can think of this as local uh, control also. So, and what I mean by that is situations where linearization works, where you're not going too far away from either a set point or a nominal trajectory that you're they're trying to track. So like when I say local here, I mean, linearization of your nonlinear problem works. Which is a lot of stuff. Okay, so maybe if as far as if we could make like a decision tree about, you know, kind of which algorithms to to consider here. So if we're in this like linear slash local linearization context, the first question to ask is, are there constraints? And if the answer to that is no, then you're in a situation where you can get away with LQR type of things. And then the next question to ask is, are you doing, are you solving a tracking problem, like a reference tracking problem, like you have a nominal trajectory to track? In which case we're talking about time varying LQR, where you're going to have a sequence of k's that are, you know, along this trajectory. And if you're taught the alt, the uh, other side of this is maybe if you're doing a stabilization situation where you're trying to just keep your system around some some set operating point, like balancing, right, that kind of thing. In which case we're talking about um, we'll say time invariant LQR. So that's where you just get a fixed, fixed game. 
That's it. That's the answer. And that's what you run with. Um, if you do have constraints that are important, either in the form of input constraints like torque limits uh, or joint limits or whatever, or um, things like obstacle keep outs, safety constraints, this sort of thing, then we're talking about, and you're talking about you need to reason about those online, then we're in NPC territory. And again, if we're talking linear or linearizable dynamics, it's convex MPC for the most part. Um, and then if those constraints are linear, which is usually the case when we're talking about fork limits, uh, actuator limits, uh, then you've got linear dynamics, linear inequalities, and that's a QP. If they are more complicated constraints, like often we have conic constraints, uh, which can show up in the form of friction cones for a legged robot or thrust cones for a rocket landing. Um, these can also take the form of uh, field of view constraints if you're trying to do uh, vision. This shows up a lot if you're doing like vision-based uh, localization where you want to keep your camera field of view uh, with enough features in it to maintain your tracking. Um, then we can look at that as a second or a cone program. So those are kind of, this is the like, right, linear slash convex regime. Um, we did all of these things so far. And like, this is, I would say, the breakdown, like decision-making tree of, of like what your problem looks like. Okay, so then um, this is like linear slash convex land. Um, stay in this world if you can, right? It is, it is the better place to live uh, if you can do it. Um, the next sort of set of things we talk about were nonlinear uh, trajectory optimization. And this is where you really can't ignore the nonlinear dynamics. This is typically like if I need to plan a motion from scratch, like I'm not doing reference tracking. This you can think of this often, this is the offline planning kind of problem. Um, you can also do these things online. Uh, I would tend to think about these things though as like online replanning. This is like you're starting from scratch and you do some new behavior. If you already have like a template library of hand behaviors that you, you already know, um, then you can do tracking and do convex stuff, right? So this is, you know, the nonlinear stuff, which you should do only when you have to. And so tend to think about this as more planning stuff than control stuff, although it can be. You can run this stuff fast enough uh, in certain circumstances. Uh, okay, so then we've talked about kind of two broad families as direct and indirect, and the kind of, I would say, prototypical algorithms in each category. Uh, the ones that are most common, most popular, whatever, are direct collocation, which is DIRCOL for short. And then on the um, sort of the indirect side, the kind of prototypical algorithm is DDP, differential dynamic programming, or ILQR, right? Basically the same thing. Uh, and so we're going to kind of go down and talk about differences between each of these guys and when you might use one over the other. Um, or sort of like pros and cons of each. So one thing right out the gate that we can say about these things that's that's pretty simple to state is that um, the DDP kind of algorithms, they're always doing rollouts. That's what the forward pass does. So the trajectories always satisfy the dynamics, which is a nice thing in some situations. That means that you can stop early or the algorithms fully converge and it's still gonna obey the dynamics constraints. So it's still a base physics. So we'd say this is always dynamically feasible. Sometimes people call that an anytime algorithm. It means anytime you stop it, always dynamically feasible. Whereas Durkhal, we write those things down as equality constraints, and they don't have to be satisfied uh, with your initial guess, which is very useful. I was, we saw last time. You can like warm start with a guess based on like a sample based planner or heuristic or something, and that can really make it converge faster. But um, the downside of that is it only actually obeys the dynamics constraints at convergence. So it's a two sided. Kind of thing. Okay, so um, similarly, the other side of that is that these Durkhal things can um, can take an infeasible guess, which is very useful, as we saw with that um, 
Acrobot swing up, right? We gave it some really dumb cartoony thing for only like part of the state vector. Yeah. Sure, yeah, yeah. And there's ways to, if you're writing your own solver, there's ways you can like force it to do that. Um, but if you're using like an off the shelf solver, you just hand it this and it's a black box, you really can't say anything about what the iterates will do. Uh, so it might, it might not. Um, usually by the time it's taken a few iterations, it's probably close, but you can't really say for sure. Um, so this can use an infeasible guess. Um, on the other side, uh, you can only guess the controls and then you have to roll out those controls, right? So it can do, which can be really hard actually in a lot of cases, what, um, uh, to get anything reasonable. Um, okay. More pro con stuff. The dirt call setup, you're using a constrained solver. You can pretty much throw any constraints you want in there, whether they're state constraints, control limits, obstacles, safety, whatever. They can be non-convex. You just throw it in there and kind of like cross your fingers and hope the solver converges. And uh, but but yeah, this can handle pretty complicated arbitrary constraints, which is very useful on the dirt call side. Whereas in DDP land, uh, the, the stock algorithm does not handle constraints at all. And there's various hacks you can use to bolt on some constraint handling capability. We kind of talked about this. You can do input limits fairly easily, but then state constraints like obstacles are a little bit harder. You have to use some kind of penalty thing or, or an augment at the garage and kind of like sort of wrapped around it to handle constraints. This can work okay, but it's, it's a little bit trickier and it ends up being a little bit hackier in practice. So kind of hard to handle constraints here. What else we got? Um, other kind of pro con thing that's kind of interesting in the DDP context, as we saw, you're computing an LQR tracking controller, like as you go and at convergence to that algorithm, you get the LQR tracking controller for free. This can be really useful. For example, if you're doing some online replanning kind of stuff where the MPC solver is slower than real time, you can like use the LQR tracking controller in between full nonlinear solves, which is pretty cool. So like if you need, you know, a hundred Hertz control rate to like stabilize your system, um, but say you can only solve the nonlinear, you know, problem at like one Hertz. Well, you solve it once a second and then in between you can run the LQR thing at hundred Hertz um, to close the loop and stabilize it. So that's kind of cool and, and can be useful in practice. So you get this like PVLQR tracking controller for free. Um, whereas in Durkal, you kind of have to do that separately. Although there are tricks there as well. Turns out the scenario I just mentioned, like if you only need like the first K matrix, turns out you can get that out of Durkal pretty cheap. There's a trick. So if you need the whole trajectory is worth not you basically have to re redo redo it. Um, okay, then sort of in the pro DDP category, these can be really these can give you very very fast local convergence. Um, you can make these things go really really fast uh, with a good implementation, which can make them really good for like nonlinear MPC. Uh, whereas the Dirk Hall stuff tends to be not as fast. Although, you know, grain of salt, like if you were to spend a lot of effort dialing it in, you can make them comparably fast. But if you're using an off the shelf, large scale nonlinear solver, like IP op, it's not going to be as fast as a good DDP solver. Um, okay, then like similarly, if you're doing this yourself from scratch, typically use an off the shelf solver for Durkal, like IP opt. Uh, if you needed to write your own, say for an embedded application, like on a microcontroller, it's way easier to implement DDP. You guys have done it basically, right? It's Ricotti, whatever, and you've got a solver. If you need to implement your own like large scale SQP solver to do Durkal, um, like if you're trying to do an embedded thing, this is quite hard. There's lots of tricks. There's lots of like large scale numerical linear algebra, sparse stuff that you got to worry about. So there's a lot going on there. Um, so in terms of implementing yourself, DDP is much, much easier to implement 
uh, on, on say an embedded system. Uh, if you could do this, you know, on a microcontroller on your robot, DDP is probably the move. Um, whereas sort of doing it at large scale SQP thing, this is hard. A lot more engineering stuff. And then finally, kind of the last one is that um go like you know like related to that like large scale sqp solvers that that are kind of used off the shelf like snop ip app these things have a ton of engineering work put into them they're really robust and reliable and have lots of tricks for dealing with nasty problems so um they tend to be pretty numerically robust they're doing all kinds of tricky things under the hood like rescaling your problem for you so that they're nice in, in floating point. You're not getting a ton of round out there. They have all kinds of fancy tricks for dealing with um, ill-posed or infeasible problems. Um, they're designed to, they like kind of automate a ton of stuff for you and they're pretty clever. Um, whereas the DDP stuff that you code up yourself, you're just doing this yourself and it's like a quick and dirty implementation like we did for class. These are not going to be very robust, right? They're going to have potentially ill conditioning issues and all kinds of little gotchas that take a lot of engineering to like get it and get dialed in properly. Basically, um, those things have already been taken care of you using an off the shelf solver. Okay, so that's kind of a bunch of pro con stuff about these guys. Uh, summary. If you have to do this online yourself, you have to write it yourself and it's got to run on like an embedded system, um, DDP is often a good choice for that. Uh, where you really care about speed. And where maybe constraint tolerance is not as crucial. Not really. Like we've done quite a bit of work in our lab on like getting these things to work on embedded systems. And there's, I mean, they're definitely, I would say it's the other way people are designing solvers to work on embedded systems. Um, like good example is be like CVX gen. There's like, if you use CVX in Python, like to set up complex problems, it has a code gen feature called CVX gen that'll dump out like a pure C embedded solver you can try to run. Um, there's a few other ones for conic problems for, um, for second order cone programs, there's a solver called ECOS that's pure C and designed to be run on like more embedded systems. So these things exist. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't say there's, I don't think anyone's really designed a chip to run control, which you could do, which would be pretty awesome, but it hasn't really happened. Probably because the market for it's not that big uh, and like compared to like iPhones. Um, okay, so that's EV. And then Dirk Hall is like, if you're, you know, if you have a hard problem that you need to get a solution for, these tend to be way more robust, require way less handholding, but maybe are slower. So for offline kind of stuff, where you care a lot about constraints, or you just want to get a good answer, uh, and it's not as critical to solve it super fast, then probably start with with the Duracall thing. So like offline trajectory design. Uh, especially if you have long horizons where, you know, the DDP stuff can kind of blow up on you. Um, and if you have nasty constraints, this is maybe a good way to go. Okay.
Cool. Any questions about this? I'm gonna give you like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So yes, people do it. Um, it can work. There's lots of tricks. It sort of depends on the scenario. Yeah. Um, if you're going to do something like Dirk Hall online, the way that is kind of typical and that works well for that is rather than solve the nonlinear problem to convergence, you basically do SQP and you just do one QP iteration per MPC time step. So you don't like fully converge. Kind of just keep updating and keep warm starting and, and this kind of thing. So that's kind of leveraging the nice warm starting properties of, of these things where you can have infeasible guesses and stuff like this. So there's a lot of tricks that, that you can play in an online setting to get speed. Cool. Anybody else? Yeah. They're just kind of inherently not as good <laughs> this way. So the real key thing there is that the Riccati recursion that is kind of at the heart of doing DDP um, is not uh, numerically stable. For long time horizons, um, it it has stability issues. It blows up. It's just bad in floating point math. Um, are you familiar with the concept of backward error? Yeah, basically there's error accumulation at each step. This is a concept from like numerical linear algebra. When you talk about like matrix factorizations and stuff like this, is like this idea of backward error. It's like how how tiny you know perturbations in the in like the uh, the inputs will like propagate through the calculation. So like if you've ever studied like I don't know solving linear systems with like LU or Cholesky or these kind of things, like um, like LU factorization for instance is not stable without pivoting, and it's that kind of thing. Like um, Riccati is not stable; it will like blow up on you. And so there are better ways to do this, essentially. Whereas in like a, a good Dirk Hall kind of implementation, you're going to use a nice, stable, large-scale matrix factorization. You can do better things, basically. Um, but with DDP, you're kind of stuck with Riccati, which has, has issues. So for short horizons, if you don't care about super tight tolerances, it can work fine. Um, but if you need to solve a big problem with a lot of nonlinearity, a lot of complicated constraints, and a lot of time steps, it's probably going to kind of break somewhere. Anybody else? Okay, so that's kind of, I guess, the end of that discussion. Um, and now we're gonna like pivot and switch gears a whole bunch. Uh, so yeah, I don't know, fair warning. Um, okay, so now we're gonna start talking about attitude, uh, 3D rotations, this kind of stuff, change gears a little bit. Um, this is mostly because I think this stuff's useful and important. And uh, I don't know, it's hard to get this in a coherent sort of, presentation in a lot of places. Um, and I think it's just like kind of a very important robotics topic. Uh, and, and there's some special stuff to talk about regarding like how it looks like to do control optimization, state estimation uh, properly with, with these kind of things. Okay, so summary is many robotic systems that we care about uh, have to deal with um, large rotations and like just to rattle off a handful of things where you would have to think about this uh, quad rotors, drones, you know, this kind of stuff, obviously in this category, airplanes, six wings, you know, uh, spacecraft, uh, underwater vehicles, submarines, this is a thing. Uh, and legged robots, even this is a thing. So really kind of any floating base system, this is something where you're going to maybe have to think about this. If it's not a, like an industrial arm that's bolted to the world, anything that's floating base, it's moving around in the world. This is an issue. Um, okay. And then like a lot of times if you haven't thought hard about this. The first thing that comes up is to use angles, like use Euler angle, something like this. Um, and this is bad. You shouldn't do this. Uh, for for very kind of simple reasons that we'll get into. So I'd say like naive angle-based uh, parameterizations. So things like Euler angles. 
um, have lots of issues. In particular, um, any three parameter rotation representation. So anything that looks like Euler angles or anything like that, that has three numbers associated with it is gonna have singularities where the representation is gonna blow up on you somewhere and do terrible things. Um, so in the case of like standard roll pitch yaw Euler angles, this happens at 90 degrees, you know, pitch, like everything just kind of explodes. Um, and these just cause, these cause failures in various ways. Um, the controller blows up, thing crashes. Um, and there, there are hacks, you know, that people implement to get around these things, like switching up the parameterization somehow, somewhere. This causes other problems, makes your code more complicated. Um, so, not awesome. Um, okay, having said that, there are, there are nice, you know, global singularity free representations. We've all seen these before. The classic one are rotation matrices, right? Everyone's seen rotation matrices. Um, and those things, you know, they do it, they do what you want, they don't break. Um, so rotation matrices are cool. And then the other option, which are very common in like kind of dynamics control, are quaternions. So who's who's ever like who's heard of quaternions before? So like pretty much everybody um, who's actually like used them in a real context before. Okay, so everyone's heard of them. Only maybe a, a third of people have actually used them before. So we're gonna go down that rabbit hole uh, and hopefully like demystify this stuff. Um, so rotation matrices and quaternions good. Um, they're globally singularity free, which is excellent. And that's what we're gonna use. Um, but they're on minimal representations, right? So your rigid body, your rotations, you have three degrees of freedom, right? It's like roll pitch all that is the number of degrees of freedom. But um, rotation matrices, quite obviously, they have nine numbers in them. And quaternions have four numbers. So in both cases, they're non-minimal. They have more sort of coordinates in there than, than actual degrees of freedom, which means they have constraints associated with them. And doing optimization over these things is a little weird, tricky. And you have to think a little bit harder but you can do it. So we're gonna show you how to do it. It's not that bad. Um, and once you know how to do that, then like everything's everything's good. So uh, optimizing over these things requires some extra tricks, let's say. But once you have these tricks, like doing all the things we've already done, like doing LQR, doing Kalman filters, doing trajectory optimization, doing MPC, all of that stuff just plugs right in. Life is good. You don't have to, it's all, it's all nice. So um, there's a few tricks we're going to show you, at which point you can just like apply those tricks anywhere you see this stuff and use all the standard algorithms and not have to, you know, have bad singular terribleness, crash your airplane stuff. Okay, cool. So here we go. Um, so the first thing is, what is attitude? Anyone have an idea here? Can anyone give me like a tight, you know, kind of mathematical definition of what attitude is? This is the the rotation part of your pose, right? So like you have pose of your thing, the rigid body that's like your position and your orientation in some sense. So position, we all know, you know, that's a vector. I write down a position from some origin of my coordinate frame. How about attitude? How do I write this thing down? Like, what do I actually write down? That's by this. Yeah, so that's the standard in robotics and aerospace. And, and I think most other engineering fields is that the definition of attitude is a, ro it's a rotation. And then the question comes up of rotation of from what to what. And the standard definition for us is going to be the rotation from some body fixed coordinate frame. So if you have your robot, you have your drone, whatever, you're going to paint some coordinate axes on your drone. And then you're going to have some coordinate system that you define for the world, you know, for the room or whatever. If you're a spacecraft, it's like ECI coordinates, whatever. You have some world, global, whatever coordinate frame, inertial coordinate frame. You have your coordinate frame bolted on the vehicle, bolted on the robot. And it's the rotation from the body frame to the world frame. You could, it's an arbitrary convention. We're going to just all agree that this is how we're going to do it. And that's the way it is. This is the standard convention in most engineering fields. Um, you could go the other way, right? You could go world frame to body frame. 
That, it turns out, somewhat irritatingly, is the convention in physics. If you go read a physics textbook, they'll do it all backwards from the way we do it. And they call it the lab, right? Not the world, right? right. But the, the reason is kind of basic. Like for us, you're thinking about yourself, you know, flying the airplane or, you know, in the drone or in the robot. And you're talking about like using sensors on the robot to, to reason and figure out where you are and run your controllers. So everything's like, you know, egocentric. Like you're, if you're thinking egocentric, like stuff that's bolted to the robot, sensors bolted to the robot, camera bolted to the robot, then all your measurements are coming in in the body frame. And you want to think about, you know, what they look like in the world frame. So having everything kind of rooted in the body frame is the norm in robotics and in aerospace and in whatever, in, in all these fields uh, where you're like in the vehicle or in the robot or the sensors are attached to the body. Whereas in physics, people think about it as you're looking down at the experiment and it's like, you know, all the sensors are in the lab looking down at the experiment, right? And so it's all backwards. That's kind of, I think, the heart of where that distinction comes from. So this is, there are many arbitrary conventions in all of the things we're about to talk about. This is the first one. And for us, just always, always body to world, body to inertial frame. So drawing the cartoon then, uh, we're going to have some inertial coordinate frame. We've got like X, Y, Z axes. We're going to use the um, capital N to denote our inertial frame, world frame. It's N for Newton, for Newtonian frame for us. It's a standard, I don't know. So we're gonna have X, N, Y, N, Z, N for our coordinate axes. And then we're gonna have some body frame over here where we've like painted a coordinate, set of coordinates on our, you know, our drone or whatever. And those are gonna be capital B for body. So we're gonna have X, B, Y, B, Z, B. And then there's some rotation from this set of coordinates to this set of coordinates. And that transformation, we're going to call that capital Q. And we're going to write that as, uh, if we're being like pedantic about this and I'm writing everything out to be explicit, we're going to write a little B and a note N on top of that guy. And it's read right to left. So it's a rotation matrix. The idea of this thing is multiplying a vector in the body frame. So uh, say it's a gyro measurement from your gyro that's bolted to the robot, or it's a you know a vector from your camera that's bolted to the robot. These are things you observe in the body frame. And if I want to rotate, rotate that into the inertial frame, I do the following thing, right? So I've got, say, some vector V. Um, so I've got a vector V that's in the body frame from a sensor, say. I hit it with this rotation matrix, and the output is the vector in the inertial frame, right? That's the way we're going to write it. And the idea here is that you can kind of follow the sequence from right to left, right? Because that's how matrix multiplication works. Ugh. Okay, so it's always rotation from body frame to world frame. Uh, there are a few other weird arbitrary conventions that will come up. So just if you aren't. Um, and then the kind of the, the meta point here is this is three degrees of freedom, right? So infinitesimally, like roll, pitch, and yaw is all there is. But there is no globally non-singular three-parameter attitude representation. And we'll get a little deeper into this. It's pretty easy to prove. Anything with three numbers that you try to use here is going to blow up somewhere. There's sort of a topological reason for this um, that we'll get to. So if you need to represent large angles, which we do in a lot of cases, you can't use three numbers. Um, and this will be obvious once we get through the whole discussion about, well, later in the discussion, the reasoning for this will be somewhat obvious why you can't. OK, any questions so far? I'm gonna close the door. That's what we're talking about. Um, so, so far we're doing rotation matrices, right? So let's get into those a little bit more. So uh, these are also called direction cosine matrices. Anyone heard this before? Nobody? Huh. 
Okay. Um, the reason for that will maybe become clear in a sec. Okay, so let's think about, I want to now zoom in to the rotation matrix, think a little bit about what's inside there. So let's write the the the, the, the components out for this rotation. So let's say I've got like my basis vectors or uh, let's make it an arbitrary vector, not just the basis vectors maybe or whatever. Okay, so I'll just number these guys. So we've got X1, X2, X3 in the end frame. This is like, you know, inertial frame components. I got my rotation matrix in here and I'm multiplying X1, X2, X3 in the body frame. So first question is, what are the rows of the rotation matrix? So each row of this thing is a vector, right? If I think about the rows as, as vectors, what are they? Let's think about this for a sec. So when I do the matrix multiplication, what I'm doing is a bunch of dot products. I'm doing a dot product with each row, right? So x1 in the end frame is the dot product of the first row of this guy with x in the in the body frame, right? So I think about that for a minute. I just think about you know dot products and components and you know sort of like basic linear algebra stuff. The first row of this guy has to be the n frame, the n1 basis vector written in body components. So literally what's happening, I want to get the whole and I guess transpose, right? So it's a row vector. So the idea is I take that dot product, this full vector, given one first component in the end frame, right? So for that to be true, it's literally like the definition, right? What I have to do dot product with the, the N1 basis vector. And for that to be legal, right? So they're both in the body frame. So just thinking about it that way, like this can't be anything else. So these rows are the basis vectors of the N frame written down in, in like body frame components. And then it's just a bunch of dot products to get the, you know, the components in the other frame. Right. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, so if I think about this a little bit uh, more, um, what are the columns of this guy? And you can think about this a few different ways. Um, one way to think about it, going back to like basic linear algebra and like definitions of um, like matrix vector products and stuff is, uh, these columns are what's Which is similarly like the definition of like, you know, a vector is like component or component times basis vector. So I think about that then. Turns out the columns here are similarly, these are the B frame basis vectors written in N components. So one way to think about this is the rotation matrix is really this like, it's just the basis vectors stacked up. It's like the basis vector of one frame written in the other frame. And it's kind of both set that turns out. It goes both ways. Um, and like the reason for this now, so now that I've written this out, Either way, right? either one. These are mutually orthogonal basis vectors, right? They're, they're the basis vectors of my frame. So, looking at either one of these, we can see that if I do Q transpose times Q, what does it have to be? Identity matrix, right? Because if I take a basis vector and I dot it with itself, I get a one. So, I take that basis vector and dot it with any other basis vector, I get zero. They're orthogonal. So Q transpose Q equals the identity. This is like pretty much the defining characteristic of rotation matrices. So based on that then, what's Q inverse? Q inverse equals Q transpose, that's right. So these are kind of all the same thing. Okay, so any matrix that has that problem where Q 
you transpose Q into the identity or Q transpose equals Q inverse. Don't know what that's called. An orthogonal matrix, right? And the reason is all the columns are orthogonal to each other. That's where the name comes from, right? Okay. That's fun fact about rotations number one. Fun fact number two is, can anyone tell me what the determinant of this guy is? And explain why, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 100%, you got it. That's right. So determinant is, another way of saying this, determinant measures the volume of a parallel type. Basically, the volume spanned by the, the column, right? So in this case, each one of these columns is a unit vector, and they're all mutually orthogonal, so they make a little box, unit volume in R3. So, so that's like the, that way of thinking about it. Um, it's like a volume thing, and um, it measures, determinant measures like how much stretching this thing does. So this thing doesn't do any stretching, right? It's a rigid transformation, so determinant one. Here's another question, though. Why isn't it minus one? You have that on tap? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So that's a right-hand rule thing. So this thing is a pure rotation of a like you know right-handed coordinate system. It um, it obeys right-hand rule. That's right. It's a signed volume is another way to say this. And in particular, what this means is it doesn't um, it doesn't do a ref any reflections. It doesn't flip any any ba basis vectors. Rigid rigid transformation, right? So based on both of those things, it is um, so in particular, right? You can have an orthogonal that has determinant minus one, that corresponds to flipping one of those basis vectors around, uh, which is a, a reflection, not a rotation. Cool. Um, so this also has determinant one. And so there's a word for this. So this is an orthogonal matrix and this determinant one thing um, in, in, I don't know, in math language and in group theory, this is called special. Kind of funny. So, uh, so we say that these rotation matrices are part of the special orthogonal group. They're orthogonal matrices, and they're special. I, I, AKA, they have determinant one, and there's three. They're in three dimensions. They're three by three. So this is called SO three. If you like group theory and fancy stuff, you say this is the special orthogonal group in three D. That's SO3. Cool. Has anyone heard of that before? SO3, yeah, I don't know. It's group theory. It's cool. Okay, cool. So that's like basic stuff about rotation matrices. That's things that they have to satisfy to be legal rotation matrices. If they don't have determinant one, it means they're doing some stretching or rotating, not just, you know, stretching or, or reflecting. Um, and uh, if they're not orthogonal, they're doing weird skew stuff, not just rotating, right? Okay, cool. So the next order of business um, is thinking about now angular velocities and kinematics and stuff like this. And the key question, so we're going to talk about kinematics, which is how you kind of map velocities with these things and how to think about angular velocities. And the real question here is, if I have a gyro on my system, how do I integrate a gyro? Like if I have a gyro, if I know my starting orientation, if I know the attitude at time zero, and I have this gyro that's measuring my omega, my angular velocity. Say I let it tumble around for 10 minutes and I have the, say I have a perfect gyro, no noise, it's just perfect omega measurements. If I wanted to, knowing say Q naught at time zero and I have 10 minutes worth of gyro data, how do I find Q in 10 minutes given that gyro data, right? That's the question. So how do I like dead reckon integrate that gyro up? Um, it's called uh, inertial filtering, right? Um, so, so that's the question we're gonna answer now. How do I integrate a, a gyro? How do I map omegas into like Q of T? Okay, so we're gonna do a little like picture drawing and some algebra here. Uh, so let's say we've got, the way I like to think about this, think about like you have a record player. So here's like this record and it's spinning around at some omega and think about like a point on the surface of the record. Cool. So let's think about this is some like uh, X, B. So I've got just some vector of some point on the record surface in the record frame. If I drew a coordinate frame attached to the record, this point's not moving. 
it's just fixed. But if I'm looking down in the world frame, if I'm playing physicist, now it's moving, right? As a function of time. Uh, so let's write that down. So we have X in the inertial frame is just Q, and we'll be explicit about the time dependence there. It's Q of T times X in the body frame. Cool. So the next thing I want to do is just uh, calculate the time derivative of this thing a few different ways and match some stuff up. So can anyone tell me off the top of their head from like freshman physics kind of stuff, what X dot is here? Like in terms of omega, like omega cross X. Remember that right-handed type of deal? So if I have, uh, you know, omega, and x, the velocity of this thing, if I'm spinning around, is omega cross x. Okay. Everyone got that? Remember that from freshman physics? Cool. So that's, and I'm going to be very careful right now about the frames. I'm going to annotate the frames. So we're talking now about, to be clear, all of these things need to be in the same frame. And this thing is not moving in the record frame. So right now I'm talking about the velocity of this guy in the world frame. So that's x and dot. And I'm doing omega cross x, but remember that's all, everything's in the inertial frame. To so do everything in the same frame and whatever. So this is omega n cross x n. And that, you know, sit there and play right hand rule for a sec, right? Omega's up, x is over here. It's doing this. That's the velocity, right? Okay. So that's, we know that from freshman physics. The next move is I'm going to rotate the right hand side of this into the body frame. So it's the same stuff. But this is equal to, remember, Q rotates from body to inertial. And if I put a Q there, now I can write all this stuff in the body frame. So omega in the body frame cross X in the body frame. Everyone cool with that? I just threw a rotation matrix on it. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to calculate this X dot using the chain rule. So I'm going to calculate the same kind of time derivative stuff, just doing some and basic calculus, and we're going to try to match terms up. So if I have x n equals q times x b, this means if I just start doing the chain rule, I've got x dot in n equals q dot times x b plus q times x dot in the b frame, right? Okay, what's x dot in the b frame? Zero, because it's it's a dot on the record that's not moving. So in the record frame, which is x dot b, that, that's zero, like by definition. So this term goes away. And so based on this, I've got now this expression dot n dot n. So I've got this guy, and I've got this guy. And I'm now going to set them equal to each other and like play some games. So this is now telling me oops, that u dot x b from here is equal to q times omega cross x from here. Agree? Yeah. This is x dot in the body. So if I'm looking, if I'm on the record, remember we're talking about like a point on the record. The record spinning around. If I drew coordinates on the record, like with a sharpie, and I'm talking about a single point on the record, in that coordinate frame that's attached to the record, the body frame, it's not moving. Make sense? Really, what we're talking about is the the motion relative to that painted on set of coordinates, right? Never moving relative to the surface of the record. I'm like literally, I take a sharpie, I draw an x y, you know, set of basis vectors on the record, and then I take draw like a red x on there somewhere you know, a coordinate two, two or whatever in the record. If that's, if I'm just staring at that thing relative to those record coordinates, it's not moving. But in the lab frame now, this whole thing's spinning around. So in, in lab coordinates and world coordinates, that point's moving, right? So X dot B is time derivative in, in record coordinates, which is zero. But in lab coordinates, but the, the key thing that we in the record frame, right? Does that make sense, everybody? Okay, so just to be clear, right? Like what we did here is take this guy and this guy 
and set them equal. Uh, okay, so we're getting somewhere. So what I'm ultimately trying to do here is come up with an expression for Q dot in terms of where we're headed. We're almost there. I need to introduce one more little notational uh, nugget. So omega cross x, we all know what the cross product is. Um, I can rewrite this ex the cross product in the following way as like a matrix with uh, the following kind of stuff in it. Oh, I kind of explain this in a second. So if I write out like just the definition of the cross product in components, which you, you probably learned to do some like little determinant thing and, you know, do all these little whatever. If I write that out as a matrix, it looks like this. I'm cool with that. I mean, you can sit there and figure this out. Is it, who's seen this before? What do you guys call this? It's a skew symmetric matrix. That's true. Just by construction looking at it. It's also because of the definition of the cross product. But you know why it's skew symmetric? What happens if I flip the order of a cross product? I, I pick up a negative sign, right? That's the same thing. It's symmetric of the definition of the flipping the order of the cross product. Okay, so we call this matrix. There's a few different things people call this. We're going to call this the hat matrix or omega hat. So omega is the vector. Omega hat is this three by three skew symmetric matrix. And so we call this omega hat times x. I write omega cross x. It's the same thing as omega hat x. And this is a three by three matrix. Cool. Okay, so now I've got this expression up here. What I'm going to do is replace that omega cross in there with the omega hat. So based on that, I've got q dot x in the body frame equals q omega hat x in the body frame. That's just this rewritten. Okay. So based on that, if this has to be then we now and say that. And it is true. Like this is true for any X, right? I didn't pick a particular one when I wrote this all out. So I have now Q dot equals Q times omega hat. Big box around that. I should be probably a little bit more careful about the frames here. So to be super, super clear, this is the B to N rotation matrix, right? And this is omega B. This is omega in the body frame, AKA what you measure on your gyro. So if I have a gyro, I have Q at T naught and I integrate and I want to like figure out what Q at T, T equals 10 is. I take my gyro, integrate this equation with like RK4 or whatever. Now I know it is 10 minutes into the future given my gyro measurements and my starting Q. Okay. Everyone cool with that? Who's seen this before? Handful of people. Yeah, cool. Okay. So now from here, um, we can so we can integrate the gyro obviously we can also now do dynamics with rotation matrices uh, matrices from here um in our state so i could like if i have a rigid body i could throw this rotation matrix into the state vector and just do this and that would be my dynamics. Um, but this is a little bit annoying and inefficient because this rotation matrix has nine numbers in it. And I know I only really need three or four, maybe. Like, so there's like a lot of redundancy in here. So this is um, slightly annoying. Uh, and so like the real kind of message here, so rotation matrices are great. If you need to rotate a bunch of vectors from one frame to the other, cool. Um, but for doing dynamics, for doing simulation, uh, and for doing control, quaternions end up being a little bit more efficient and easier to work with, just fewer numbers and they're easier to, yeah. The Q dot. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm, yes, it's the time derivative of that same Q. Yeah, yeah, so remember this three degrees of freedom, right? So this thing has nine numbers in it. 
So what's going on there is there's got to be implicitly a bunch of constraints, right? Because um, ultimately, there's only three DAW. So what are those constraints? Yeah, so all this stuff that we just said about like properties that the rotation matrix has to have, if I write down a generic three by three matrix, that's nine numbers that can do anything. For this thing to be a valid rotation matrix, it has to have all So meaning we can write these down explicitly as constraints. So in particular, all three columns have to be unit norm. So that's three constraints. And then all of these columns have to be mutually orthogonal. That's another couple of constraints, right? So there's there's all this stuff. So basically, um, there's nine numbers in there, but there's only three off. That means there's actually six constraints in there. And basically, the six constraints are unit norm, mutual orthogonality, return of one. If you like stare at that for a second, you realize that that ends up defining six algebraic constraints on the elements of the matrix. So that's three off, nine numbers, six constraints. And the fact that it's got so many extra constraints and so many, it's a kind of just annoying to deal with. And I'll show you in a sec, if you naively integrate this with Runga Kutta, it does not stay a rotation matrix. It pretty quickly like drifts and does dumb things due to numerical run off and all this kind of stuff. So you have to like find some way of like reorthogonalizing re or like renormalizing it uh, eventually if you're going to integrate it. And that's way, way easier to do with the quaternion also. Uh, There's only one constraint with the quaternion. Okay, any other questions about this? Okay, keep tracking. So quaternions are basically more, more sort of efficient and, and easier to deal with for dynamic stuff. Um, okay, so here's, we're gonna now kind of like talk a little about quaternions and like compare them. Uh, and so uh, to get there, we're gonna first define the axis of rotation uh, which is a unit vector and we're going to call this a just a for axis so if i'm rotating i have some axis of rotation and i'm rotating by some angle about that axis right and so we've got the axis and we're we're going to similarly define the angle of rotation about that axis This is a scalar units of radians for us. And we're going to call that theta. Cool. So based on these two things, I'm now going to define this thing called an axis angle vector. We're going to call that V. And it's just equal to the axis, which is a unit vector, times the angle. Which So now this thing, a 3D vector, it points in the direction of the axis of rotation, and its length is equal to the uh, angle of rotation in radians. Uh, so it's a 3D vector called an axis angle vector. Uh, so it's 3D. Um, and then uh, the angle theta is equal to just the norm of this guy. And the axis is just if I take this thing and normalize it, I get back the axis, right? So it's kind of, I can get the axis and the angle from this guy, right? Okay, so we're going to take this thing and we're going to kind of figure out how to get to quaternions from here, which is nice. There's like deep connections here. We'll get to in a little bit. Um, but this is pretty intuitive, I, I think. Uh -huh. Okay, so for, um, for a constant omega, if I'm rotating about the same axis at a constant rate, Uh, or basically for for short, you know, time, I'd take just a really tiny time step. We can think of um, we can think of this axis angle thing uh, as the integral of omega. This isn't exactly true. Well, it's exactly true if omega is constant. If omega is not constant, this is not true. Um, but it's true if omega is constant. It's also true enough over small small times. So if h is tiny, this is still kind of basically true. Okay, this is an approximation. So not true in general. 
that's true if omega is constant, omega of t is constant, and it's true if h is tiny. Um, okay, so given that, that's, you know, general fact, right? Um, let's see, page. Um, in terms of this axis angle thing, or we can define the quaternion. like so. So we're going to call this little q. So big q is rotation matrix, little q is quaternion. And here's what a quaternion looks like in terms of the axis and the angle. Um, it's got four numbers. It's a 4D unit vector. And the, uh, the first number is post theta over two. And then the, the rest of the three numbers is the axis unit vector times sine of theta over two. Uh, these things, uh, we call this, this first part, the scalar part. And then this bottom part, which is the three vector, the vector part. And these kind of also are, are they're often like treated separately. And just from this uh, definition, what's, uh, what's the norm of the quaternion or said another way, what's Q transpose Q? I know a few people know this, and I see people like, yeah, someone just yell it out. It's cool. Yeah, why? If I do Q transpose Q, uh, yeah, if I do Q transpose Q, I get cos squared plus sine squared, which is always one. So that's kind of the easy way to see that. And so what this is telling you is, rotations correspond to unit quaternions. I can have general quaternions that are not unit norm. Those correspond to other things, right? Other kind of transformations, not really. Just like the rotation matrix, actually, this is the other thing to point out here is this is exactly the same as the rotation matrix. Rotation matrix, I have Q transpose Q equals identity. Quaternion, I have Q transpose Q equals one. And these are very closely related things. Um, so similarly, right, uh, Valid rotations correspond to unit quaternions. Um, the thing that's cool about this, as opposed to the rotation matrix version where it's Q transpose Q equals I, and that thing's got all kinds of you know orthogonal stuff, this is super trivial to renormalize. So if I get a quaternion that's not quite unit norm due to like round off numerical drift, I just normalize it like divide by its norm, and then we're back to a unit quaternion. So that's really nice. And like this makes simulating these things numerically and on a computer very easy. Um, other fun facts about these guys. Uh, what is minus Q? So the way I think about this, if I go and put in... Um, not super... Okay, I'm going to just write this down and then we'll talk about it. So it turns out Q and minus Q. Uh, the way to see this is to, if I do theta plus to that. What happened? No. I mean, if I add Q five, what's going to happen? I pick up a well. It's the same. It's the same rotation, right? But obviously, if I if I rotate by two pi, but the quaternion changes, picks up a negative sign, because it's theta over. Make sense? You don't see that? This is weird. And it turns out quaternions are not two pi periodic; they're four pi periodic because of that theta over two, which is bizarre, and a little funky. And this this caused a lot of hangups. Uh, okay, so. Basically, Q and minus Q correspond to the same rotation. Uh, said another way, they, they both correspond to the same rotation matrix. If I converted this to a matrix, um, that's kind of the algebraic version. And this is called, uh, the way to see this, right, is add two pi to theta and look at that definition. Uh, this is called a double cover. So there's
in like fancy Lie group math land. Um, and it literally just means there's two quaternions for every rotation matrix. And there's also an easy way to see this that we'll get to. Um, the final note on this, that's a quirk, um, is that algebraically, quaternions act exactly like rotation matrices. So we're going to define a bunch of stuff next, like products and stuff like this. Um, if you're just doing algebra, basically just think about quaternions as if they're rotation matrices. And like, there's a quaternion product I'm going to define in a second, a quaternion inverse that's just like a matrix inverse. Like, just think about them as if they're rotation matrices when you're doing math and like everything carries over. Um, so operations on quaternions are analogous to rotation matrices. And this is kind of in a meta way, this is like the whole idea of group theory. It's like there's different representations of the same thing, but they represent the same like geometric objects. And so they kind of have to algebraically act the same for that to kind of work out. Yeah. We'll get there. Yeah. I'm going to draw some pictures probably next time. There is a ge geometric picture of this that's very clean and nice and intuitive. And it explains a lot of this stuff. Uh, we're going to do it next time. So hold tight. Um, okay, so here's uh, some algebra stuff to just kind of have. Um, uh, so quaternion multiplication. I'm just going to define it. Uh, so if we have uh, Q1 times Q2, people write this different ways. I'm going to use like a star, like asterisk, the main quaternion multiply there. Um, I don't know. You can do whatever you want, just for, for clarity. So the idea here is if I have two quaternions and I have the scalar and vector parts like this, the product looks like this. It's S1, S2 minus V1 dot V2 up top. And then down here, it's S1 V2 plus S2 V1 plus v1 cross v2 so something interesting about these things is they combine both like the classic dot product and cross product into a single product the weird thing about this is historically actually these were invented first and then people were super weirded out by like 4d vectors back in the day and so in order so these were invented by hamilton same guys like hamilton's principal was physics stuff and then actually the people were super freaked out by these and still kind of are, to be honest. But uh, um, basically no one liked these because they were not intuitive and stuff. And so Gibbs uh, invented, you know, like cross and dot product vector notation that you all learned in undergrad as a way of like simplifying this stuff and making it more intuitive. So it turns out this came first. And actually the, the standard vector dot and cross products that I just used there were invented later as a way of like, I don't know, simplifying quaternion stuff. For people which is funny um okay so that's that the other thing about this that we're going to use um is i can rewrite this as a matrix vector product um two different ways which corresponds to if i just take this definition so the first thing i'm going to do is take that definition pull out all the s1 v1 stuff to the left and pull out s2 v2 to the right as a vector and then i'm going to get the following thing um so if i have so the idea is i'm going to pull s2 v2 out of that expression to the right. And I'm going to get the following like matrix vector thing. This S1 minus V1 transposed V1 and then S1i plus V1 hat, which takes care of that cross product. So if you stare at that for a second, literally. So I can do that the other way too. I can pull out the uh, can pull out the S one V one to the right and do the same thing, and I'll get like S two minus V two transpose V two S two I and then minus V two hat. These look almost the same. The only difference is. 
And we're going to call these two matrices. This one we're going to call L of Q1, as in left multiply. And then this one we're going to call R of Q2, which means right multiply. Right. So if I have a quaternion expression like that, as a matrix vector thing, the reason we're doing this, if it's not super obvious yet, is this is how we're going to take derivatives. So I need the Jacobian of some expression involving a quaternion. I'm going to change it into, like if I needed to take the derivative of this, with respect to Q1, the exact rule of matrix calculus, pull the Q1 all the way to the right, and then whatever's to the left of it is the Jacobian. That's the trick. So if I need to take derivatives of these things, we're going to use these matrices. Uh, OK. That's some algebra. Last thing, or there's a handful of like other quick things before we run out of time. Um, there's this thing called the quaternion conjugate. Uh, which is uh, equivalent to the matrix transpose. So if I go stare at this expression again and I say, okay, I want to rotate. And matrix transpose means the opposite direction rotation, right? It means I'm flipping face. I go up the sign. What happens? Nothing, right? Same thing. What happens? With the exactly. So that's what we're doing. So conjugate is the opposite rotation. So what we do is we flip the sign on the vector part only and leave the scalar part alone. That's the definition. Um, you write this with a dagger upstairs like that backslash dagger in, in LaTeX, and definition, just leave the scalar part alone, put a minus on the vector part. Just like uh, before, we're defining all these matrices, we're going to define a matrix version of this so that we can take derivatives through it. And um, it's pretty trivial. We're just going to call this T for transpose, I guess, uh, times Q. And it's just going to be a 1 and then a minus I down here, such that when you go multiply, you know, S, V, you get the desired result. Right. So all these times when I'm like defining these matrices, it's literally just so I can do calculus, right? So I can chain rule and do derivative stuff. Okay, so that's conjugate. Uh, let's see, what else we got? Um, we will need to be able to rotate vectors by these guys. Uh, and this also kind of gets at, so I'm just going to tell it to you. Um, we'll get it a little bit more into the derivations. Um, so the way you handle vectors in this context is, Remember we talked about like scalar and vector part of these guys. So I want to ever like rotate a vector. I literally just shove it in the vector part of a quaternion and leave the scalar part as zero. That's called a pure vector quaternion. And so if I want to get like X in the N frame, like doing the rotation thing, turns out the way this works out, it's maybe not super obvious, um, but we'll, we'll spend some more time on this. It's um, the following thing. That's X in the B frame. And then this is Q dagger on the other side. So this, this looks, by the way, exactly what it's like to rotate a matrix. So if I have a matrix defined in like the body frame and I want to rotate that matrix into the inertial frame, I hit it on both sides with, with Q like this. So this looks just like rotating a matrix in matrix land. Um, okay. And then I can rewrite this expression using our you know set of our tricks um as oh yeah there's a little extra piece here um i gotta define one more matrix um so we we talked about you know this idea of like shoving a vector in the vector part of the quaternion the zero scalar part we're going to make up a matrix for that as well we're going to call that h for hat um and so hx equals uh just zero x like this um so h is just a zero and then a three by three identity like this. Cool. And so now that we've got all that stuff, I can take them. Right, using all the stuff we've done a couple of different ways. So this is H transpose L of Q, R transpose of Q, H, X. That's ugly. Or it's also, uh, depending on like which order I want to do stuff, and do the R part first. So those are completely equivalent. Just me staring at this. Right. 
right. uh, okay, so either one of these um, is the definition of the rotation matrix, right? Because that's what a rotation. So this expression, either one, pick your pick, uh, gives the rotation matrix as a function of the quaternion. That's cool. Um, and then the last one, this I'm throwing a lot of stuff at you. Don't sweat it. We're going to do more. Like I'll I'll kind of give you the geometry and the intuition uh, mm -hmm. next time. Um, the last piece to get us like totally on par with rotation matrix land is the kinematic stuff. I'm just going to kind of state it real quick. Um, so we've got Q dot quaternion derivative. It turns out this is one half Q times uh, this like omega pure vector thing, which is equal to one half L of Q times H times omega. So, right, and this thing is a four by three matrix. Right? So it maps omega into this four dimensional Q dot. And now with all this crap, I can simulate dynamics with a quaternion. I realize this is really fast. We're going to do this again, basically, from a, like a different viewpoint, slower next time. So don't don't sweat it too much. And in fact, let's go do that. Before we leave, and show you a couple things. And I should say, this is totally the standard, right? So for, for kind of all rigid body simulation stuff in robotics and, and aerospace stuff, all the simulators that you're used to using pretty much use quaternions for this stuff. Um, okay, so where's this code? Here's the code. Uh, make it a little bigger. Okay, so what I've got here is just all the stuff we just wrote down. So that's the hat map, the skew symmetric matrix guy. That's my... L matrix, that's my R matrix, that's my, um, you know, dagger thing, that's my hat matrix, um, uh, making up some stuff. This is, you know, rotation matrix from Quaternion. This is just for your own, you have this code now. It has all the things I just, you know, define. Um, I'm gonna write down a rigid body. So this is like Newton Euler, or just Euler dynamics for a tumbling rigid body. We didn't talk about this yet, but, you know, just so you know. So I have some inertia matrix and we're going to do this at 10 Hertz. I'm going to make up initial conditions, which are like identity rotation and then some random angular velocity. And we're going to do this both with a rotation matrix and with a quaternion because I want to point something out. Um, so here's the dynamics with a rotation matrix. Uh, this is what we just saw, right? Q dot equals Q times omega hat. And then this is the uh, the Euler dynamics for, for a rigid body. This is just, we're going to make this thing tumble and simulate it forward. So that's the rotation matrix version. We're just going to do vanilla RK4 on this guy. And I'm going to go simulate this for like 10 seconds. It's 10 hertz, right? So this is like uh, 10 hertz or whatever. This is, you know, a minute maybe, whatever. So that the interesting thing here is, so this is, you know, what comes out of that from the state vector for the rotation matrix. Um, remember, this is supposed to be the identity. It's Q transpose Q. That actually doesn't look too, too bad. That's pretty good. Um, actually... Weirdly good. It probably shouldn't be that good. Um, let's try this again. I, I think we got a benign, not that fast tumble rate. If I stretch this out a little bit, do a little bit longer, let's try that again. Yeah, so this is uh, still actually pretty good. Let's make this a little faster, just so it gets to make this like, I need to make my point. <laughs> uh, okay, so blah, blah, blah. Yeah, so that's really bad actually that's too fast obviously i need to take smaller steps you get the idea so this can like very much go to crap on you pretty quickly i don't know it's something reasonable yeah okay so you can see obviously this is not coming out as an identity matrix it's good to a few different digits but like it's not a rotation matrix after just simulating it for like a minute or so um and exactly does anyone know how i would turn this back into a legit special orthogonal matrix from here if I want to like renormalize it into a legit rotation matrix, I don't have any ideas. Yeah, some kind of projection, sure. Do you know how to do that? Find a chance. Anyone have any ideas? Hint. So the, the trick is you do an SVD. So SVD de decomposes you into rotation matrix, singular values, rotation matrix. And the idea is if you SVD that, the singular values for a legit rotation should all be one, right? And if you do it for this, it won't be. So literally what you do is you SVD this, you set the 
uh, sigmas all to one, and then you smush it back together. So that's the trick. That's kind of annoying and kind of expensive though, right? So let me do this for the quaternion right now. So here's the exact same stuff, but with quaternions in there. So it's easier to write, smaller state vector. And if I just naively do Runge-Kutta on this, very similar deal, I'm going to get uh, not perfectly unit norm quaternion. As you can imagine, if I this is tumbling fast, it gets worse. If I do it longer, it gets worse. Um, so uh, I don't know. We can make this even longer just out of curiosity and see what happens. That's going to take a while. But yeah, you see, okay, so it's not perfectly normalized. That may seem benign, but check this out. For the quaternion, it's super easy to do that projection. It's literally just normalize the quaternion. So a good trick here is right in my Runge-Kutta, I can just normalize this guy at every time step, and it costs almost nothing. So now I can do this as long as I want, and I'll get a perfect unit quaternion every time. So that's why at least for dynamic stuff, this is like a, just a nicer thing to do. Uh, it's easier to deal with. Okay, end of story. Quaternion is good. Rotation measure is cool too, but for dynamics, probably quaternion. And uh, more on this next time.